Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome to this special, special Patreon edition of a little bit of a podcast for you. Um, if you are a regular su- subscriber to Talking Bollocks, you're no doubt aware that there is a Patreon scheme. You can sign up at uh, patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith for $5 a month. Now, you get all sorts of acid rain behind the scenes bits and pieces. You get all sorts of Talking Bollocks bits and pieces. We do um, a monthly live um, uh, chat as well on Zoom where, uh, where we all get together and have a bit of a laugh. Um, and you can ask me any questions you want and I will answer them and tell you stories that I can't tell on the podcast, etc. But you also get your own bollo cast every month and you get in advance, you get advance warning of knowing what guests I'm getting and you get to send your questions in. I ask the questions, you get the answers in your very own bollocast. You also get the main bollocast um, earlier than everybody else. All sorts of all sorts of reasons why you should be giving me five dollars a month, frankly. <laughs> um, but to give you an idea of what you guys are missing out on if you're not on Patreon, then I thought I would uh, I'd post this up and give you an idea. Um, as you will hear, it's half an hour of questions and answers with James Murphy, who's very generous with his time. Top man. Um, the, I mean, you, you could have asked questions in the past of Scott Ian, of Max Cavallera, of Fish, of... Um, oh, well, and then we go to Sepultura, Derek Green, um, Andreas Kisser, um, and the famous producer... Uh, the um, the inimitable Jens Bogren. So um, they are just some of the people you could have been asking questions of and having your own podcast to listen to specifically for you. So if you want to sign up, please do, because this is the kind of stuff that you are missing out on. Um, I mean, sometimes there's, there's an extra hour um, uh, of material that um that just goes behind the paywall at patreon for subscribers so this is my attempt to get some more patrons it's quite it's pretty blatant isn't it but ultimately if you listen to the content and you like the idea and you like the concept come and sign up even if it's for a month sign up for a month download a load of stuff and leave again i don't mind it's entirely up to you but anyway anyway come join the fun it is patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. Without further ado, though, let's get stuck in to patrons' brilliant questions from the ever-brilliant James Murphy. These are questions that are asked by patrons who sign up at Patreon. Um, I tell them who I'm interviewing, and um, they ask the questions, and they get their own sort of podcast. So this all goes behind a paywall. So these are for people who actually these these are for people who actually hand over money for stuff. So they're all cool. Um, awesome. So first question is from Robbie Maguire. Um, <laughs> well, we've kind of answered this. Any news on the new Disincarnate album, the follow-up to 1993 Dreams of Carrie and Kind? I'd heard some material had been written. Well, I think we've kind of covered that, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I wrote a bunch of material uh, some years ago that I've largely scrapped. I've hung on to some bits and pieces. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm going at it anew now. And uh, as I said in the in the podcast proper, um, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm sort of in the process of, of writing still, but also parsing what's already written into which category it's going to be. Disincarnate, uh, the other project with the other guys I mentioned, um, which is called Blood for Us, by the way. Um, and, uh, with uh, guys from uh, uh, November's Doom and and uh, a few other bands that right now I don't know if I'm okay to mention, um, uh, and and myself and uh, or whether it's you know something I, uh, for a third project that I have in mind that I'm also sort of keeping on the on the down low at the moment. So that's where it's at. Uh, and what was the name of the 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 project? Blood Rest. Bloodverous, almost like uh, imagine the word carnivorous, or, or something like that. Of the verus, you know. It, so it's uh, uh, P L O, but with a elongated you know line across the top of it. Uh, so it's just one O, but it has the the like the little hyphen looking. 
ranking thing above it. And uh, D, so V L O D V O R O U S, I believe. Vlodrus, right, okay. That is. Well, uh... Yeah, Blood Forest. Yeah. Right, okay. So that is. Um... Wow, that's a, that's a mouthful. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and right next. Well, by, think, by the way, you know, it's, it's sort of a it's sort of difficult to sort of pronounce when you look at it. But I can tell you, the logo looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's what that's all that counts, really. Um, yeah. Now, um, I, I, I hate to say I told you so. By the way, but uh, very first question from one of the fans is about um, disincarnate. So you know. Uh, next up, you did tell me. Yeah, I did tell you. Next up, Mark Pensum, huge fan. Bunch of questions. Back in the early nineties, you went from death to obituary to cancer in quick succession. Uh, was the deal with e- with each of these that you do the album and a tour cycle as a lead player, or do you officially join the bands and things just didn't work out? Must have been a bunch of stuff to learn for those touring cycles. Uh, well, a, a, a couple of things. Um... Uh, let me try to uh, uh, address them in order of what I would sort of think is the most important takeaways. Uh, one, I didn't really go from death to obituary to, to cancer. Uh, cancer I only did as a guest musician. That was it. I went from death to obituary to working, writing on, and working on the record deal for my own project, Disincarnate. So it was death, obituary, disincarnate. And Cancer was done as a guest thing, a, a quite extensive guest thing, actually. Um, but it was a guest position. Uh, and I sort of did it in between working on the songs for Disincarnate and, you know, working on the record deal and to get all of that in order. Um, so, again, uh, just because uh, it was referred to as a... Uh, as a, uh, as, a, as a as a lead guitarist, yeah, I guess you you could say. I mean, I wasn't the lead guitarist in death because Chuck also played leads, and you also, you also have to remember that I actually wrote music on Spiritual Healing. Uh, I wrote uh, a quarter. I, I wrote twenty five percent of the music on the record, um, and uh, and I played on the you know on the rhythm guitar tracks as well. So. Uh, I wasn't just the guitar player in death. Um, when I went to obituary, yeah, I was pretty much just lead guitar player. They already had the record completely written, and they already had all the rhythms uh, completely recorded. And uh, in any event, you know, Trevor wanted to play them all on that record anyway. So, yeah, I just came in and did my solos. So it, 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 that is a correct characterization of my participation in obituary, but not quite uh, a correct characterization of my participation in death. Um, as far as cancer, like I said, that was just a guest spot, and all I did was play leads, and that was all it was supposed to be, but they knew that I was working on my disincarnate stuff, so they knew I was kind of, that I, you know, that I probably could take the time to do, you know, a little touring with them, and so they asked me to do it, and uh, to be honest, they, they kind of bribed me to do it by offering to... Uh, make it sort of like a little European vacation and uh, pay also a ticket for my girlfriend and have her come over. And she, you know, she came over and made friends with all their girlfriends and, you know, they hung out while we were touring and then we got to hang out and travel around. So it was, you know, it was a neat thing, but yeah, um, I was just a guest uh, lead player on that. Um, It got improperly, improperly characterized, as me being a member of the band by the band's label, because they were, frankly, they were just, they thought it would help the sales. Yeah. Um, I, my, my photo wasn't even supposed to be on the record. Um, that photo session that I'm in that, that you see, uh, 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 on the back of the record, uh, I went, I went along, I tagged along on that photo session. The idea was that they would do every, a version of every shot that the photographer set up, we were going to do it both with and without me, and we did that. Uh, the ones without me were meant to be for the album cover. The ones without me were meant to be for tour promotion because I had, by that time, agreed to do a tour. Right. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the label just did, you know, uh, uh, they agreed to all of that. They understood that, that I was a, uh, a guest musician. Uh, they understood that I was already under... Uh, 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 
uh, development contract with Roadrunner for my own project. They knew all of this, but they went ahead and I think it was called Vinyl Solution that label. They went ahead and just did what they wanted anyway, <laughs> yeah, um, because that- it, they figured it would help the sales of their record. Unfortunately, it's led to you know twenty plus years now of you know twenty five. 28, so, yeah, something like that, years of me having to explain, I, I was not a member of Cancer at <laughs> all, I never was a member of that band, I was strictly strictly a, a, a guest soloist on the album, and then a, sort of a hired gun to fill in on the tour until they found a second guitar player. Well, um, well you've, um, you've said... So there you go, and yeah. you know, hey, I left, if, if he wants to know why I left Death, um... You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be frank about it. Me and Chuck got along fantastically while we were just, you know, recording the album and, uh, you know, rehearsing uh, for the tour. But once we got out on tour, you know, I, I think we sort of saw different sides of each other that neither one of us liked. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to speak for Chuck, and Chuck can't speak for himself, so that's, uh, so I'll have to leave that there for the most part. Um Although what I, what I will say uh, in Chuck's defense on that is that I was just as headstrong as him. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was his band. <laughs> so, so there you go. Yeah. Um, that's only uh, that's only going to end one way. I, I did not like being told things like who I could be friends with, who I could be nice to. Yeah. Who who I was allowed to talk to on a festival, like what bands I could be friendly to. Uh. Who, you know, what band I could accept a merch from and actually wear it on stage. I didn't like being told things like that. It, uh, yeah. yeah, that's it not stuck good. in my craw. Yeah, it's it stuck in my craw, and 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 combine that with my aforementioned head strongness, uh, it was a recipe for some serious headbutting between yeah. me and Chuck. So that's why I went to obituary. The reason why I left obituary is the reason that they gave me that I might have to leave the band eventually from the moment I joined, which is that uh, they told me the very first day I met with them, the very first day they decided, okay, you're our guy, go record, you know, you're going to record the solos and we're going to go on tour, you're, you're, you're our guy, we're picking you, we're picking you, that from the day that that happened, they, they also told me and said, look, we didn't want Alan to leave, we didn't kick him out, he left because his girl's having a baby and he wants to be responsible, he doesn't know how this music thing's going to work out and so... He's got a job, and he doesn't want to lose that job, and because he's got this baby, and et cetera, et cetera. So he decided to leave. If he decides to come back, if he changes his mind, we'll probably take him. He's our bro from way back, and, you know, he wrote half this record. So they told me that that might happen, and indeed that happened. Um, I would also say a contributing factor would be, you know, hey, when I joined Death, I knew an album was being written when I joined death. And so I put myself in death mode, you know, and I, I adapted. Uh, and uh, I started writing, ri- I, I listened to the four songs they already had written at the time that I joined. And, uh, and I put myself in that mode and then I co-wrote the remaining four songs. Um, and when, so when Chuck asked me, hey, you got a riff to go here? I had one and it fit. It fit the mold of, of what was going on because you know, I, I, I was in that mindset. But when I joined Obituary, I was already thinking about my own project. I was already thinking about the project that eventually came to be known to Incarnate. And so I started writing music for it. So I wasn't writing music for anybody else. I was writing it for me. I was writing it for my project. And uh, it came out the way it came out because of that. Right. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so... Uh, I guess to, to, to sort of cut to the chase, uh, Trevor, when Trevor asked me, hey, do you got riffs? It wasn't like when Chuck asked me if I got riffs. Yes. When Trevor asked me if I got riffs, I played him my disincarnate riffs, which are nothing like obituary. Nothing. Right. And I told him, right. I said, hey, well, this is stuff I've been writing for a project I want to do. You know? And they don't really sound like obituary. He listened to them and said, yeah, they don't sound like obituary at all. And that was it. He never asked me, can you write some obituary style riffs? I never got asked that. Yeah. You know? And and so probably also they were like, well, he doesn't really write like, it does, his writing doesn't sound like obituary. 
Yeah. And so that, that probably also played into it. And also, yet again, the aforementioned headstrongness. You know, <laughs> they were, they like, let's just, to, to, to be as politically correct as I can, they, they liked to partake of certain party activities that I had already quit. Uh, right. Four or five years, four or five years prior. And didn't, you know, no longer partook of. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't really fit in on that side of things because I was the only guy who did. I was the odd man out. It wasn't like it was an even split. Oh, some of the guys do, some of the guys don't. No, they all did, and I didn't. So you, so. Were, the, you were the odd man out, and you were also um, uh, not their mate who left, and they wish he hadn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was sort of a very different type of guy. And then, you know, they're very – I mean, we're all from Florida, but I was an Army brat, so I lived all over the world, including Germany for six years. You know, uh, uh, while I was coming up, and you know, they had, you know, I think their family moved from somewhere else, but they were larger. They had, they were just sort of Florida boys, you know. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, I, I very much wasn't. And this was just a lot. In a lot of ways, I didn't fit in. I was the, I was the square peg trying to fit in a round hole, you know. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And uh, so you know, all those things sort of played in to why I wasn't bothered at all when Alan came back. Number one, I had been forewarned that it was a, a possibility. Number two, I was already writing my own music. I knew I wanted to do my own records. So it was a thing where I just, you know, I just went in that band and I did my thing. And when it was time to go, I left. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would not have had a choice to stay had I <laughs> had I wanted to, but I didn't particularly want to. I was cool with it. I got kind of mad about how it happened because they didn't sort of tell me up front. They didn't go, hey, James, remember we told you Alan might want to come back? Well, he does. You know, they didn't do that. They, instead, they, they, they just didn't call me on a day that we normally would have rehearsed, and I couldn't reach any of them. So I drove out to rehearsal anyway. Well, I don't want to miss rehearsal. I don't want to be the asshole that doesn't show up, you know, even though they're incommunicado. Because normally, like, Trevor or somebody would give me a call and confirm rehearsal. Um, or, or Frankie, you know. And uh, I didn't get the call, so I tried to make the calls to everybody whose number I had, and which is pretty much everybody. Nobody answered. So I show up, and I walk in, and there's Alan jamming out, you know, with the band. I was like... Well, uh. what the fuck, you know? So I, w I was irritated by that, but it was uh, really just a matter of being irritated that they didn't give me the courtesy of telling me, you know? Yeah, um, I know. But I don't, I don't hold it against them. I mean, I see those guys around all the time, you know? Well, not all the time anymore, because I don't go to Tampa as much. I don't go to as many shows, and, you know, hell, no one does for the last four months. But you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah. Uh, it's just uh, a matter of... Uh, uh, they're, they're there, I'm over here, we're only about an hour away from each other, and so occasionally I do see them, and, uh, you know, up until about a, a couple years ago, there was probably about a four or five year period where I, I sort of collaborated a little bit with Donald on uh, some cat rescue stuff, um, and because uh, he's very involved in that, and I think that's very admirable, I, I love that he does that, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, to this very minor extent that I was able to help some, some stray cats as well. Um, I'm, you know, I'm happy that we were able to establish that, you know, connection. So I get along with those guys fine. I just, uh, you know, I wasn't their guy. I never was their guy. I was a guy that was okay to fill in until their guy was ready to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, right, we're on to a question for uh, well, another question from Mark Pensum, um, who says, "I've seen you say in interviews that if you're doing a guest spot, you just listen to the material and lay down takes. How long did it take for you to be feel comfortable enough in your style to go about it that way? Um, is that the case if you're doing a full project, or do you tend to work that out more to keep the variation?" Um. I'll be honest, I probably spend a little more time these days uh, than I did back in the day when I did most of my records that you're probably thinking of. You know, you're probably thinking of spiritual healing, cause of death, 
probably uh, uh, Death Shall Rise, uh, Dreams of the Carrying Kind, you know, Low, Live of the Fillmore, uh, I mean, Low or The Gathering, etc. I did it more like that back then, Mark. I, uh, um, I would, uh, j- yeah, just go in and listen. And the thing is that I don't know. There wasn't a time that I recognized that I could do it that way. I didn't. Basically, I was thrown in, you know, I, I was thrown into that situation kind of with death. I would say that, you know, we spent so much time rehearsing the songs and writing the songs uh, prior to entering the studio uh, for Spiritual Healing in the summer of 1989 um, that uh, I wasn't able to work out too much in advance of the leads, but I was able to get a sort of a little framework, kind of a framework how they go. But I still had to make up some right there in the studio, and that's just sort of when I realized I could do it and and I only did it because I had no choice. It was just the situation. I was in the studio. I did not have solos worked out in advance at all. And uh, in fact, I had never really sat down and wrote, you know, worked out solos for anything ever because I didn't really have anything yeah. um, uh, to do. I didn't have bands really before death um, that I recorded with or wrote songs with. Um, uh, you know, I, I had toured with Agent Steel. And I wrote one song for them, and I, I don't even remember about that song. We never recorded it in the studio. Um, and, you know, and I was working with the guys in Hollow's Eve up in Atlanta right before I got the gig, uh, but we never even wrote any songs. We were literally just rehearsing the old ones and, and uh, auditioning uh, the, the couple of spots that were open still. Um, we were auditioning for, the, for those. Um, so we would audition people and we weren't really fully writing music yet. So basically that was really my first experience was spiritual healing of going into the studio and having to record solos. And I didn't know I could do it until I did it. So unfortunately, Mark, I can't tell you, uh, you know, exactly when yeah. that happened, you know, that I didn't, you know, it wasn't something that I even knew I could do until I had to do it. And then I really had to do it in obituary because I didn't, I didn't rehearse the record. I didn't write any of the music, nothing. I came in the studio. It was all pretty much recorded except some of the bass, some of the vocals, and the lead guitar. The rest of it was done. So I came in, and and I just I had to do it. I had to do it on the spot. And then, you know, I just got a call one day from Scott Burns to, hey, this band Cancer's here. They want you to come down and do a solo. I just had to show up, and I had to do it, you know, on the spot. And then... I did the one solo, and the next thing I know, they're asking me, hey, you want to do all the rest of the solos on the album? <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. You know, so so I, I had to do them. So it was just something that I figured out that I could do because I was thrown in the fire and had to do it. Fair enough. That's a, a, that, that, that's a really, that's really cool to know. Um, so Mark, Mark has some other, another question which, we've pretty much, which we pretty much covered in the podcast. Um uh, talking about live performance, but he does, but he he does say, um, which is really cool. Um, it was fantastic seeing you back on stage for Roadrunner United, even if the camera wandered off and you're ripping solo. <laughs> you, you know what? <laughs> that has been a recurring theme, and I'm not the only one to notice it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you noticed that, Mark. And my fiance has noticed it because she loves to watch videos of, of you know, me, anything pops up with death or obituary or, or testament. She said, it is crazy how often I watch a video of you playing live and it comes to your solo and they're on Trevor or they're on Eric or they're on, they're on Chuck when you're playing a solo. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, welcome to my life. The camera does cameramen do not like me. <laughs> well, I've he... never met any of them, but they did not like me. <laughs> oh, that, well, uh, yeah, it's. It, 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 I I don't think it's personal, but um, you you do oh, seem yeah, to be yeah, you, yeah, you do you seem to have been be. unlucky I, I over the years. Don't know any of them, but you do seem to have been unlucky over the years. It's been it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it is a recurring theme. Uh, it is very much a recurring theme on any live video you watch of me. Even if, like, they they go to me at the very start of the solo, they'll wander away before I'm even a quarter of the way into it. 
Uh, it's it's that not. It's not. Make sense. It's, hey, that's the featured part of the song at that moment. That's yeah. So logic would tell you that's where the camera should be. But you know what? I, I I've never enjoyed seeing myself on camera anyway, so it's never bothered me that much. But I have noticed it. <laughs> I have noticed that recurring theme. Um, well, we've also got something else here. We've got. Um, uh, uh, Mark again says you were doing a huge amount of work trying to get a death tribute moving, um, and then death to all came about. Were were you ever um, uh, made an offer to be uh, part uh, any part of death to all at any stage? Never. Right. Never offered it once. Never offered once. And he says also, will the material ever come to light, um, or is that lost in the complex compl- uh, politics of death? Um, I don't know if that's... Um, uh, there's definitely some politics, um, but I don't think that it is shelved forever. It's collected a lot of dust. Some of it is going to have to be reworked just because of contractual things with people. But I I do hope to be able to dust that off and finish it. Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. But he also says spiritual healing to me was an, was a game changing um, uh, album, and your playing felt a big part of bringing out the musicality that Chuck would lean more towards on later albums. So there you go. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Was that Mark again? Yes, it was Mark again. Yeah. Uh, th- thanks, Mark. Thanks for noticing that. Um... Well, you're gonna you're gonna love this next bit because I'm I'm going word for word here. This is exactly what is written in front of me. This is what he posted. Okay, clearly the guest spot on a future Acid Rain release will be the finest solo you've ever recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what do you have to hear in a band that makes you take up an offer? Oh, and he he also says uh... by he also says by the way even the remotest prospect. Uh, of this actually happening at any point in the future has got me fully giddy with excitement. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, um, I, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of times that this, this is a way, you know, this is one of the methods by which I, you know, feed my family and pay my bills. So, you know, a lot of times what I have to hear to take up a project is how much they're willing to pay me. Now, that sounds a little mercenary, but I'm a studio musician. It's what studio musicians do. Um, I hire my services out to play on records. Now, I there are once a project that I enjoy more than others, and of course I'm not going to name names in this, but um, when the part that I'm going to play, of course it's really great when the band is really good, Everything's just firing on all cylinders. Everything's there. You can tell it's going to be a good mix. It's a good, great performances. Uh, they got good tones. It's just a joy to play over those, especially if the part they want me to play over is actually really appropriate for playing a solo over. As you'd be amazed at the amount of times I'm asked to play solo over these incredibly disjointed parts that are sort of static. They don't go anywhere. And it's just like this hodgepodge riff that sort of doesn't even stay in one key ever. And really the only way to play to it is to play really rhythmically and to play to each and every little change in it, which almost makes it sound like a lead version of the rhythm part you're playing over in some ways, you know, that's really the only way to successfully play over those. Either that or you just go nuts and don't care, you know, but I, I care. So I don't, you know, I care about every project, you know, so that I, that I, that I decide to actually play over. Um, the only time I get real picky and choosy is if I'm getting too many offers for the amount of time that I have. Then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll politely decline ones that uh, uh, that I don't really particularly find all that intriguing musically to me, you know. But uh, you know, if things are slow, I'll I'll play on anything really, you know. Uh, I, I look at it as a challenge, a musical challenge. Like, how can I make this sound cool? You know, yeah. what can I do here that will actually enhance this? But yeah. like I said, no matter what, whether it's something, whether the song is really good or whether the song is really bad, um, whether, you know, it, it, a lot of times for me, the enjoyment of it, the enjoyment of actually doing my part of it, because, you know, doing my part of it, I don't have to listen to the chorus. I don't have to listen to the verse. I don't have to hear the intro. I don't have to worry about any of that. 
I just listen, I can just listen to my solo part and decide what I'm going to do. I'll listen a little bit before and a little bit after, and I, and I will give a listen to the whole song to make sure it fits thematically. I'll do that. I'll listen at least once and make sure that what I do just sort of thematically enhances the song overall. Yeah. But in terms of the in-the-moment enjoyment of it, when I'm actually playing it, recording it, it doesn't matter to me what the rest of the song is. It's just the part that I'm playing over. And it's it's amazing how many times over the years I've been given something to play over that, oh, man, I just love the band. I think the song rips, and, I, and uh, you know, everything's on point. But the part they've given me to play over is the static, repetitive thing that goes nowhere. <laughs> yes, the old, uh, so oh, let's just leave that leave static, that blank for a solo. repetitive riff. Yeah. There's no changes to it. It doesn't change the whole time. This is like four or eight repetitions of the same riff, and it literally goes nowhere. Well, if the rhythm goes nowhere, then I haven't. I can't go anywhere either, yeah. you know, so it makes it hard. And uh, so for me, the parts that are most enjoyable to play over are the parts that give some space and some harmonic activity changes that allow me to do what I like to do with a solo, which is to sort of, it's almost like a little story unto itself. Absolutely, you know? that's uh, that you that you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I, I, our guitarist Paul works diligently on his solos, um, incorporating all those uh, everything that you just said there as well. Because if it, cool. like you said, if you're not play, if you're playing over something that's not interesting, neither will you know the solo can't save it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I've had you know a lot of times people ask me, oh, what's the favorite thing you've played on recently? And I'll play it for them, and they're like, oh, I don't really like that song. Why you like that so well? So well, listen to my part. It's fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and by the way, Mark, uh, and, and by the way, Mark, you must be enjoying listening back, hearing all your questions answered. You actually <laughs> heard the words from James Murphy's mouth. I'll play on anything. Well, we know anything. I, I, I will, uh, given the time. I, I, given the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, properly compensated, you know. Here, here we go. This, here we go. There's get a big Howard. I got, I got to get this in. There's, there's, there's this feeling, that, especially that a lot of young metal fans have, that like, oh, if you're not doing it for the love of it, then you're a fake phone. In oh, no, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm a studio musician. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a studio musician. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Studio musicians from the dawn of fucking time get paid to play. You absolutely know? quite quite and, rightly quite rightly and believe you and me yeah. believe, believe you and me i will paypal you five pounds for the uh, the 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 pleasure of playing <laughs> on our next album guaranteed okay. i think i think that's like a hundred dollars now howard <laughs> uh, oh, uh, god knows what it is mate god knows what it is well look that's um that that's us uh, it's been great it's been great catching up um after all these uh, after all these years well after a couple of years um Really, really cool. I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad you're doing well, mate. Everything sounds like you're coming together. It's coming together for you. And and like I said before, you know, if there's if there's anything I can do to help in any way, give me a shout because um I will be coming after you for our next album. Awesome, Howard, and thanks to Mark for all the all the good questions. And yeah. Thanks to you for uh, for uh, putting up with me for you know for all this and oh, for, not for at all. being v for very generously forgiving me <laughs> oh, my, my, the, my, my, my absolute pleasure you mate. on that solo <laughs> I don't know no, you're, you're an absolute pleasure but also um, don't forget um, I will be in touch and let's let's get you on the um, let's do get you on acid rain on a on a Saturday so uh, our fans can ask you loads of questions absolutely cool great man okay um, I'll be in touch and I'll let you know as soon as this is coming out all right, man. Thanks, and take care. No worries. Take care, dude. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it. That's what you would have been missing out on. Um, it's not often I do this. I think I've only ever done this once before because it's it's only fair on the patrons who uh, pay the money. Um, and come and join the fun. Seriously, it, 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 there's really the pat is you know the patrons are really cool. There's a there's a genuine little community there. Um, you get your own Patreon app, uh, which is which is really cool. Frankly, it's a media player and all sorts. So you, you, you know, you can you can totally get in with that. Your messaging and and, and honestly, it's genuinely a growing little community. And um, and if you're into talking bollocks or or acid rain or both, um, it really is a, a cool place to be. 
So uh, you will get, you know, you get access to everything earlier. You get access to Acid Rain merch before everyone else. You get, you get basically, you get access to everything before everyone else. And a lot of stuff people will never see and they will never hear because they are not a patron. So it's entirely up to you. Hope you've enjoyed that. That was just a little uh, free window into the world of Patreon. And uh, if you'd like to sign up, it is patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. And thus ends my online begging. Thank you very much. Take care. Speak to you next time.